Morning guys, Dr. Ken Norberg with another fireplace hunting seminar, <laughs> deer hunting seminar. Uh, you're going to enjoy this today, I think. Uh, it's another another in a series of, of uh, seeing how we put together uh, a great knowledge of the, the area you hunt, a great knowledge of whitetail lore, habits and behavior, of whitetail, predictable stuff if you know, if you have the truth about it, these things. Uh, putting together your knowledge that you gain from deer signs, really important, there's so much you can learn from deer signs, and then uh, and special skills, meaning in most cases, special precautions you need to take when you're hunting older bucks. You know, there's deer hunting and there's buck hunting. <laughs> if you're hunting, buck hunting is quite a bit different than deer hunting, as most hunters do it nowadays. But in buck hunting, you have to take a lot of precautions to make it work, to become regularly successful at taking older bucks. So there's four, those four ingredients. Now, I've been teaching you about all of these things up to this point, and um, a couple of weeks ago I decided to start putting together and how all of these things contributed to taking certain big bucks. Now, <laughs> there's taken a lot of big bucks over the years. Uh, I've got another one we're going to talk about today, one I've taken. I, I'm going to talk a lot about bucks that were taken by my sons as well, you know. Uh, and there's been a lot of them. During the last 30 years, my three sons and I have taken 105 mature bucks on public land. That's almost a buck each a year. That's pretty incredible buck hunting. So I, I want you to be able to do the same. And you're going to learn, and, and from each one of these bucks that I'm going to talk about, you're going to learn how all these things come together so that you can take bucks like this. And this one, one today was, he's not a, he's a monster buck. <laughs> it was another one of those bucks that was a, well over 300 pounds live, but he didn't have the greatest antlers. But I didn't know he didn't have the greatest antlers until he was down. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Now, one thing I want you to know here, this today is July 1st, 2020. There's a couple of things that are important about this day. One of them is that it appears that we're going to have to be, we're going to have to learn to be safe with COVID-19 still around and no vaccine to protect us during hunting seasons. You know, we have to think about that. I've been thinking about that. I'm going to talk about that in the near future. In fact, I'm getting a right, ready to write an article about of that for Midwest Outdoors, which I've been writing for for about 30 years now. But anyway, um, the other thing that's important about the date, in six weeks, we can start baiting for black bears here in Minnesota. The black bear season opens September 1st or thereabouts, and two weeks later. And if you're, if you're, a veteran bear hunter, and they've been doing it for years, I'm sure you're getting tired of seeing small bears. You know, you probably see lots of small bears. You've gotten to be so good at it that you, you just don't fail to see bears during the hunting season. But if you're one of those, and, and I was that way, my boys and I, when we, when we started hunting bears, and we would see so many of them that we thought, this is almost too easy. And we started hunting with bull only. And not only that, we started, we became determined from now on we're only going to take big bears. And when I mean big bears, bears over 300 pounds. And oh my, there's bear hunting and there's, there's trophy class bear hunting. Those are two different things as well. No matter how good you might be at bear hunting, it doesn't necessarily make you really good at taking really large bears unless you hired a guide who's good at it. So, but I teach people how to hunt bears on your own. It's do-it-yourself black bear hunting. But at any rate, so that's coming up real soon. And if you're interested in taking a really large bear this year, and I've already been giving advice to people who have called me about this 
in the last couple of weeks. But you need this book. The original uh, printing of this book back in 1988-89 became the Bear Hunter's Bible in America for years and years. It had the reputation of being, if, if, you, if you bought this book and, and do what it says in there, you're going to get a bear, almost guaranteed. And it became, and what I taught in that book changed the way black bears are hunted all across North America and are still going on. Meanwhile, meanwhile, since that time, black bears have become more and more difficult to hunt over bait. And they're getting smart about some of those older bears, the trophy class bears that we're talking about are particularly, are becoming more and more difficult to take using bait. And so like buck hunting, <laughs> like hunting mature white-tailed bucks, there are a lot of new precautions you have to take if you intend to take a really large bear. There's a whole bunch of them. If you do it, your odds of taking a really large bear are going to be very, very good. If you don't know what those precautions are, what to do, your odds of taking a really big bear are very, very poor, as you may know by this time. But whether you're a beginner or an old veteran, if you're a bear hunter, if you like bear hunting, if it's this year you'd like to take a really large bear, this is the book you need to own. So order that soon. You know, don't wait till September 1st to get that book. By that time, it's too late. You've already, you've already done too many things by that time that will make it impossible for you to take a big bear. How about that? Impossible. You'd have to be extraordinarily lucky to take a big bear. Uh, most of the things that you need to know today to take one, the way not many people in this country know about them. These, these are new things, including effects of wolves where you hunt. If there's wolves there, well, that can affect your bear hunting as well. Lots of things to know. This book comes with a color DVD, all kinds of tips in the woods that we filmed of me doing things that you have to do to take older bears. Uh, it's a good learning DVD. You're going to enjoy seeing that going, and it goes along with this book. See the fat ground? You see those all over in grizzly bear country. They dig for roots and eat roots and there's a string or black bears like to eat roots too and that's what it looks like when it, where they dig for roots, just like that. cleaning up our bait side opening uh, and we created a substantial brush pile behind this little tree which forces a bear to come around it to this side to get at the positioning bait, the bait that they want most. But at any rate, don't wait around, get this book soon. We're getting really low on them. We're, we're going to have to re uh, do another printing pretty soon, but this is a do it yourself black bear hunting 5th edition. And it's a wonderful book. And you'll, if you're a bear hunter, this is one you want. This is the book you need to have today. Okay, now, the other book is this one. <laughs> now, it's uh, July 1st, uh, August. Uh, if you're a bull hunter, you're going to be out there uh, uh, scouting in about a month, month or so. Uh, here in Minnesota, the bow season for whitetails be, uh, begins about the middle of September. So we're getting we're getting close to time where you got to start thinking about this. You know, if you're a bow hunter or even a gun hunter, there's so much to do and learn. Like bear hunting, there's deer hunting and there's buck hunting. <laughs> I keep saying that buck hunting is something altogether different than what most people. Uh, believe is deer hunting. Uh, so much different, so much more to learn. I like what the bears, you know, the white-tailed bucks, older deer, have learned 
everything they need to know to avoid hunters, to, to avoid stand hunters or or still hunters or people making drives. They, they were really difficult to, to, to take, much less see. So if you want a book that's going to put you close to unsuspecting bucks within 50 yards year after year, this is your book, again, uh, full of things that you just won't find anywhere else. Because I don't believe anybody else has done the hunting related research that goes into uh, uh, this book. And uh, it, this book is, is rapidly changing the way people are hunting whitetails in America today. Especially if you want to take a big buck. And even more especially, if you want to take a big buck almost every year, this is your book. So don't wait around. You get close to the time now where you're going to have to start using the knowledge you're going to learn from this book. So I'm uh, just warning you, time's coming. And gee, we're getting low on these now too. We're going to have to order another printing out pretty soon. So uh, uh, they're, they're going to go fast now pretty soon. Thank you very much. Uh, and now let's get back to business here. Now, Here's a buck I took a number of years ago. Uh, early in the season, during the first part of the season, in fact, it was, you know, we, generally when we go to deer camp, we're there for a couple of weeks. And uh, it was the next, the last day of the hunting season, and uh, I still hadn't taken a buck. And uh, the, on the evening before, or a noon actually, the day before, while well, heading back to camp from a, a stand site in the south of this region where this rough map is, is uh, made, uh, I was traveling up this way and here's a deer trail going across here like this. And I ran across four inch tracks fresh in the snow. Uh, a big buck, and, you know, oh boy, a big buck, fresh. That buck it was near. It wasn't alarmed. It was walking. You know, there's no reason to believe it was alarmed. So, either it was watching me right now and hadn't decided yet whether I was dangerous enough, so I better get the heck out of this area or get out of this area, and uh, or it was bedded. And it was midday, so more than likely it was bedded. And so, but at any rate, I didn't stop to look closely at those tracks. I just got, I had this excitement in mind and I, I headed straight out and went back to, to this trail to get back to camp. And I didn't go back there in the afternoon because the wind was from the north, northwest, coming this way. And up to this point, I had never thought of creating a trail that could get me to this area here, I said feeding area, a grassy valley, from the south. I didn't have any prepared deer trails, you know. Us gardeners, you know, we use deer trails to get to where we're going because there's less brush in the way, there's less stuff on the ground, it's a quieter way to get somewhere. And I had no prepared deer trail, no deer trails with fluorescent tacks on trees every 20, 30 yards to guide me in darkness to where I want to go, and or trails that we had tossed aside all the dead branches and sticks laying on the trail so we'd have kind of a quiet trail. I had none of that. So I got back to camp, and I, this is going to be a problem. I, I want to hunt this buck. Now, what I had in mind was something I had learned while scouting there three weeks earlier. Now, when scouting three weeks earlier, in this area here, and I've taken some bucks in this area. Uh, it's an old clear cut here, and this kind of the north end of it here. I found this little valley here, it's a high ground on each side, and kind of steep bank coming down to it on both sides, and young evergreens on those banks on both sides. But down here was a, this grassy valley, and that, that grass was as tall as me. I mean, you could have a hundred deer in there and never see them. And this thing was fairly long. It was not quite a quarter mile long. It was not just some little 
patch off in the woods, a pretty good sized thing, you know. And deep grass, and there were trails, deer trails in there, in the grass, you know, there were definite deer trails, and there were tracks in and droppings on the trails, and lots of red osiers. You could hardly see the red osiers. They were only this tall because deer kept eating them in there every year, obviously, and a lot of black and brown tips on those and multi-stems and all the evidence of, of a favorite graze area after November 8th. In our area, our whitetails start eating browse about the beginning of the second week in November. And it's an overnight thing. One day you can go through a patch of red osiers and there's no evidence of feeding. No white tips, you know, ragged white tips in there that tell you, gee, a white tail's been eating that. I've been seeing some of those on my favorite roses in my yard lately. I get visits from deer in my yard. But at any rate, none of that. And then the next day you can come down there's white tips, ragged white tips all over the place where white tails have been feeding. It's a, a sudden change each time. It's always a big surprise. Here it is, well, I didn't surprise. We know about when it's going to happen. So, favorite feeding area here. And one of the neat things about it, I found this a couple of years before, here's a little patch of spruce trees here. Bigger trees. They are 30 feet tall. Tight little patch. A nice blind. <laughs> And I've sat in there a couple of times and I had a big buck come up behind me there at one time and another one, great big one, grunting over on the other side of me one year. But anyway, down below the hill, the hill drops out quickly to this grassy valley, the end of it there. And right in there is a, is a, like a bathtub sized hole in granite, solid granite. And it's spring fed because it always had water in it about a foot deep in that wa the water. Clear, nice clear water in there and it flows out of there. Goes drifting down a little, little stream down to this, little stream going through this area. But it's right there. And that's kind of, and there was, when I was scouting the area, there was a lot of fresh tracks around that little watering spot. So it was a popular place for the deer living in this area. Now, I also, while scouting earlier, discovered right there was the bedding area of a big buck. Big tracks, big droppings, uh, old antler rubs. You know, that was early, uh, early October, the last time I was there. And the, there was antler rubs made the year before multiple. A whole bunch of them there, a couple dozen of them in this area here, about two acres in size, not very big, just a little, little than this map would indicate, but you can see it's right there. So when I saw those tracks going this way, I when I got back to camp and I thought about that, and I thought about it all afternoon, I couldn't get this buck off my mind and wondering how I was going to hunt it, is that what I really wanted was a south wind. Now, in a lot of trails up here, I could approach this area from upwind. I had a trail I could use in this area over to that spruce cone, or I could go all the way around and come up a little valley from this stream that going through here and go straight south from there to the spruce cone and get situated here where I could keep an eye on this end of that, that grassy valley close to the watering spot. And I was thinking about that, you know, in the morning, that buck is going to feed there. He's going to be browsing there. Because he's here now. And he's going to browse there. And this was after, after I think it was November 17th, as a matter of fact. By November 17th, the first two-week period of breeding is over. There's three of, three of those two-week periods during that whitetail rut. You know, going, one, another one beginning December 1st, and another one beginning a few days before January 1st. Well, so at this point, bucks are back in their normal ranges. Uh, all ages of mature bucks, from two and a half year old to six and a half year old, that happen to be, happen to have been beaten up by the big dominant buck who owns this whole area. But, with once breeding is over, they can come back, and that big buck won't challenge them. It's okay. They can come back, and they live in 
smaller ranges within that big bucks range here, and, uh, which overlap doe ranges and that kind of thing. But anyway, so I could be certain this buck would be bedding here in his usual spot. He wouldn't be chasing does somewhere. And at the end of the breeding, by the first phase, those older bucks down in the breeding bucks, and I, I couldn't, I didn't know if this was a down in the breeding buck or not. But he was big. But he'd be here one way or another. And he would be feeding there in the morning one way or another. And not only that, uh, he would probably work across this way. It's a, he couldn't just go into the wind because this thing was, that was, you know, an east-west kind of thing. So he'd be working his way crosswind through there, cautiously, I suppose, because he couldn't, the only thing he could smell is what was upwind of him. So he'd be working his way through the year. And our bucks in wolf country commonly start heading to their bedding areas around 9 in the morning. Sometimes it'll be as late as 10 under ideal circumstances, but they go there earlier than whitetails other were other than other areas where there are no wolves. And so I figured that it would be logical when he comes out of here and goes to this valley and starts feeding his way toward the east here, he would probably time it. It would be easy. There's a lot of room there. He can zigzag and take his time, and being cautious and listening, and wait, make his way to there where he could get a drink of water about around 9 o'clock a little bit before maybe or afterwards, but between 9 and 10 for sure, somewhere in that hour, he would go, he would finish that trip across that feeding area at that watering spot. Now that excited me. Now, I figured because of that, I was thinking about it, gee, I, next morning the alarm went off at 4 o'clock, and there was only two of us in camp, me and my old buddy, Silver, uh, Ricky from Wisconsin. We've been good friends for years and years. Talked to him often all year round. <laughs> and a uh, good guy in camp. Hey, you know, he, he and I just enjoy each, being with each other. We've done that for years. And been, he's taken some nice bucks in this country, so he's always had to come back. But he takes it a little more easy than I do. He's a little older than I am. And that morning he decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep in this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it's, well, I always do better in the afternoon. Of course, if you only hunt in the afternoon, you do better in the afternoon. I think that was one of the main reasons he sometimes thought he did better in the afternoon, which is fine. So he was going to sleep in that morning. So, well, I told him, I said, well, this morning I'm going to break the, one of the most important rules of buck hunting. <laughs> All, you know, that rule is always approached from downward or crosswind where you expect to see the deer, the buck. Sit downward or crosswind where you expect to see the, the buck. And so, the only way I had is to approach that area from upwind. And we had north, northwest wind flowing this way, down that way. So I decided I had to take the longest way around to get there. Now, the reason I did that is because when you're 200 yards or more away from whitetails, they'll smell you. There's nothing to it. That, that's not, there's nothing to it. Yet your airborne scent is going to tell them, and there you are. And if you're not moving toward them, they're not going to be too concerned about you. They'll just continue whatever they're doing, either feeding or, or, uh, or moving back and forth between the fooding and bedding or whatever. But 200 yards, they're safe. Well, I probably would have been all right to take this way, but when you get close to this area here, we're getting pretty close to this this feeding area. And, and um, the, the, the breeze was really light that morning. But, um, and it usually will build up a little bit at sunrise, and finally by 10 o'clock, that's about the maximum for the day. So I thought, well, I won't take the quick way. I'm going to go way around, because I don't want to be anywhere near even 200 yards of that buck. I don't want him to know I'm anywhere around. Yeah. 
So I took the long way around. And these are deer trails. Well, this is an old logging trail, but it's all brushed in. And hardly can tell it's a trail anymore. I take that way around, and then all this wood trail, these are all deer trails. This is an old clear cut, and by that time it was getting pretty grown up. It used to be pretty clear when we first started there, but it was getting filled in with popples and lots of different kinds of evergreens. So all the way around by, like that, and this going through a wooded valley and getting down close to the stream here, and then coming up through a valley here. And when I came up there, and because I had so far to go, this was, I was talking like two miles get there in dark. I had to leave by five o'clock. They've camped, so I had to get going. And you walk steadily the whole way, keep your head pointed, or mind what you're doing, and flashlight beam, little beam, down the ground, no more than twenty feet ahead of you, twenty yards maybe. So and here's my tax. They keep showing up along the way. So easy follow. I don't have to stop. You walk steady, you don't stop the whole way. Just Keep going, keep going. As long as you do that, you might pass many deer along the way, both sides of the trail. They aren't going to be alarmed by you when you're moving in that direction. They're going to stop, maybe freeze and cover, watch it go by. But as long as you're doing that, you're not acting as if you're hunting. And they aren't going to be alarmed by you. And they'll resume whatever they're doing after you're gone, past them. So keep going. Keep going up this little valley here and up a little steep bank there. And now I'm directly north of that clump of spruces there. And I remember there's a dead, the lower half of a dead tree about halfway there. There are little things along the way that told me I was doing okay. I'm right on the trail that I want to be in, following my tracks, my taps. And there weren't many here because right through here there weren't many trees big enough trunks to, to put tax on. So finally I, I stepped into that clump there and I'm directly upwind. Now I figured at this point, you know, that buck, he probably got out of his bed about 4 a.m. That's pretty normal time for a deer to get up in the morning and start feeding, go to a feeding room and feed. And if there's water nearby they'll usually pit water first before they start feeding, but if there's water along the way, they might pit water again somewhere along the way. So anyway, he, he was in this feeding area. And probably but getting there early like that, you know, uh, by this time, when I got to this point, it was maybe around 6 o'clock, still dark as can be. And uh, so uh, I figured he was back here somewhere. You know, taking his time, this long, grassy valley, taking his time, and he was still over here somewhere, so he couldn't smell me. My wind carrying my scent in that direction. Couldn't smell me, because he's over here. So, what I did then next was go straight, there's a deer trail going through this you get in the valley, it's deep grass. See, the, trail, the open area was only about this wide. Deer trail there with tracks, and you know, I've been used by deer for months, and so it was a well established thing, and it was fairly straight across the valley here. And I went, got on that deer trail, and went, kept going across through the grass here, and then I got on the upside, and there's a bank that goes up. A rocky hillside there, and a bunch of young pine trees growing there. And there's one pine tree situated right there, where I could sit. I could get sit down behind it and watch that opening. It was straight enough, so I could watch the opening all the way to the other side. And there I was, you know. I'd sit behind this tree, and I've done that many times. I've taken quite a few bucks with the only. Cover in front of me is a little pine, a little evergreen tree, and I have to push aside some boughs, maybe a little bit. I know sometimes I spent time quietly whittling away a branch to create an opening so I could look through there. I head that down, and then I'm sitting on my stool, nice and quiet behind him, my rifle up over a branch in front of me, kind of resting there, you know, and some scope, you know, everything's all set up. 
and watching this trail through the deep grasses. And from here, where I was standing, to the other side, where that little watering hole was, was about 100 yards. It was a long way across there. Long shot. No big, that's not a long shot for a seven millimeter magnum with a two to seven variable scope on it, duplex reticle. Well, it, it, I, you know, and especially when you got a nice rest there on the branch, you know, so I wasn't worried about it being a long shot. But it was the only place where I could sit, where I could be completely hidden by a buck going this way. Now, what I figured would happen, and having seen bucks and other deer hit my trail shortly after I used them, they find a trail with human scent on it, a trail scent on it. They're going to stop, they're going to sniff it, they're going to look around, they're going to look in the direction that I went when they hit that trail. Uh, they might not do that, spend much time there, but it's going to stop them. And I was counting on that. I wanted that buck, when he hit my trail, to stop, to, to think about that scent he's smelling right there. It's kind of fresh, you know? And when, that, when he stopped here on the trail, and I had a rest, and I could you know, didn't have to be rushed. There wasn't going to be a deer just going blunk across the trail and it's gone. It's going to stop there. My scent would make him stop. So instead of my trail scent being a problem, in this case, it improved my chances of taking a big buck that morning. You know, I'd never done that before. I thought, well, you know, it's a bad idea. So anyway, I was sitting there, and it's 100 yards to where that little that little watering spot was located. And pretty soon it was 9 o'clock. And at 9.15, just boom, all of a sudden here's the buck standing in that trail. He put his head down a little bit and he was looking at it and his, his head came up. And I could almost imagine him thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know there was any human anywhere in the area until he hit that trail scent, but it was fresh. <laughs> well, he didn't have much time to think, because I took my usual neck shot, you know, I hit neck vertebrae, dropped them in his trucks, and, uh, you know, really, I love the, that shot, it's so humane. I mean, that deer is done for immediately, he dropped in his trucks. And I took a deep breath and I was smiling. I said, by golly, this worked. You know, I have never had many opportunities to try this since then, but boy, did this work so well. And it was, I was a big buck, all right. Well, I got up to him and I walked back to where he was. And uh, oh, it's, oh, it's huge. I mean, this was a, well, you'll see the picture here in just a few seconds and look at this picture. And John, leave it on there long enough so they can get a good look at this buck. He's fat as a pig. He's a huge buck, but he didn't have huge antlers. Now, <laughs> people write to me once in a while and say, well, how come you guys don't shoot? Huge, huge bucks every time. Well, it's because we don't have huge, huge bucks everywhere. I mean, record book bucks. No. And we have some enormous bucks where we hunt, and not many of them. Maybe one in every two or three square miles might be that big, but a lot of our big dominant breeding bucks aren't that big yet. And four and a half to six and a half year old bucks is when they're usually dominant breeding bucks. Well, last year we had some three and a halfs that were dominant because they our deer population is down is so low, only five per square mile this last year. Well, close to six. But at any rate, so he was a huge buck, but he didn't have the one of the heaviest bucks that I've ever taken. But I was pretty excited. It was a ten pointer. <laughs> I was say it's a ten pointer. Well, I went back to camp, pretty pleased with that. And I didn't field dress him right away because I wanted to get some pictures and. Uh, Old Silver was still sleeping, he never heard my shot. So I got him roused up and get some coffee in him and we'll grab our big 
pa uh, plastic toboggan and go back there. It was quite a walk, you know. Silver, he always says something every once in a while about that, that goofy Norwegian leading me for miles and miles in the dark in the woods. Is, well, it was one of those kind of hikes getting there. And kind of a rough walk. And uh, anyway, we got there. And so we dragged them up onto that deep grass there, and, uh, up toward that spruce clump where it was more open. And so we got our pitcher there. And I field dressed them there. And we put them on the sled, and the two of us got on the rope. And we couldn't hardly move. <laughs> that thing was just. The yeah. silver, you and I are never going to get this deer back to camp, just the two of us. So I, what I had to do was cut off the hind quarters and I hung them uh, in one of those spruces in that spruce clump. Got them up high off the ground so in case a wolf came along, he wasn't going to get at them very easily. And uh, I always bring along a special rope with a pulley when I, when I know I'm going to, when I think I might have to do that. And I've done that before. But anyway, so we brought them all the way to camp, had coffee and lunch, and then had to go back again. This time when we went back, we took the shorter way this way. We took them out the shorter way, too, actually. Went back and got the hindquarters and brought that out. So we spent all the rest of the day getting that buck to camp. It was quite, a, quite an operation for two old guys like us. But we did it. We managed that just fine. But I'll tell you something, that night we were both having leg cramps like you wouldn't believe. I one point old silver said, get a hammer hit me in my head, it hit me on my head to put me out of my misery. We were just moaning and groaning. We finally got through that episode and got some sleep. But, uh, uh, but anyway, this broke my rule <laughs> because of the circumstances involved. But in order to do that and for that to work, I had to know all about buck behavior, and had to know the territory and what was going on here and this feeding area and this bedding area and that watering spot and things like that. Those all contributed to the ability to take that buck and to and the ability to actually go downwind to a stand site, a good stand site and then sit there and, and then know that buck was going to stop in that little narrow trail when he hit my trail set, which he did. Everything went just exactly as I thought it would, imagined it would. And I was pretty happy hunter that day. So, yeah. Now, you know, one of the things I want to mention, you know, when you, I like the next shot. I'm not saying everybody should do that. You have to be uh, excellent marksman <laughs> be using it because that that vertebrae in a in a buck's neck is only that thick from top to bottom not like that not pretty big and it isn't right in the middle unless it's facing you if it's looking if it's standing or facing you that vertebrae is right in the center of the neck but it, from the side it's closer to the up the top side or the back side than the front side. If you shoot in the middle, you might miss it all together. You might you might hit big blood vessels and nerves, so it might, it, it might you know be a lot of hemorrhage and die quickly anyway. And some I my biggest buck actually had a 30 caliber bullet under the skin of his neck toward the bottom there and survived that. Might be the reason it became a swamp buck. But at any rate. Uh, uh, we'll do talk about that one day too. But anyway, uh, so but I like that shot, and I like, like to use it because it is so humane. You know, for most guys, a chest shot is, is easier. It's a bigger target, you know, yeah, from front to back, side to side, much larger target. And there's vital organs there, the, the lungs and the heart. And a deer will die very quickly if you if you shoot through that area. In fact, in the front part of the chest, uh, whereas the vertebrae aren't very large from top to bottom in the neck, in the front part of the chest is kind of a little hump in a in a deer, in a bigger deer. You notice it in bucks, it kind of comes up a little bit. 
in the front part of the chest, the vertebrae are much larger. They're up to four inches from top to bottom in the vertebrae. So it's a much larger target there. And so I usually tell people in my camp, if you're going to be shooting deer in the chest, shoot high. Don't forget the heart. Shoot high, uh, and you'll always get the deer. If you shoot low, it might be further than you think, and you're going to shoot under the deer or or hit a front leg, which it doesn't mean you're going to get that deer. It's much better to shoot high on the chest. Shooting high, you're always going to get him. Shoot high in the chest. And and he'll go down quickly. He won't go very far. A lot of them will just drop right there, but some will go a little ways, but not very far, and then go down. Uh, that's an amazingly deadly shot. And if, in my case, if I was worried about the distance, I'd go for that. Like one buck I shot was 400 yards away. So I knew my shot was going to be 17 inches low. So I shot the width of that buck's chest from top to bottom, not quite, but up 17 inches and then down just a few inches, shooting high in the chest. And by golly, <laughs> that was a long shot. I got him. Uh, he went about 25 yards and went down. So that's a good rule. Shoot high in the chest. Don't shoot low. Forget hard shots. Unless you're a bull hunter and he's, the deer is 20 yards away, or a bear hunter, and the bear is only seven yards away, like to teach people to hunt him with a bow. It wouldn't be seven yards. But at any rate, um, high, high chest shots with a, with a firearm are, are, are very deadly. And if you, any part of that spine in that area, he's He'll go right down. He can't. He's that that deer. It, all the the nerves running to the body from that part are are you know those nerves are, are destroyed and that deer can't move. It's going to go right down. So, there you go. But so anyway, but you know and there's a reason. You know, a lot of, a lot of, some guys say, oh gee. We, we don't, it's wrong to go out there in the dark like you guys do, but sure it's wrong if you don't know how to do it. Because if you don't know how to do it, you're going to be alarming deer out there and, and you don't even have a chance to even see them dark. You'll hear them going and starting and all that kind of thing. But if you know what to do, that's not going to happen. Uh, but at any rate, you know, and then they say, well, when I, so when I get to where the deer is and and uh, I at least see one running, and I'll have a chance to shoot at him. Well, many years ago, I quit firing at whitetails that are running, bombing. Boy, they're tough targets. I, a couple of my sons had taken some that were bombing, did pretty, and got them. Kind of crazy good shots, but they were fairly close when they were moving like that. I much prefer fire at deer that don't know I'm there. No reason to believe I'm there. So they're either standing when I pull the trigger or moving very slowly and generally within 50 yards. Uh, I would say 95% of deer I've taken in my lifetime were within 50 yards and some of them were as near as 10 yards. My son John has taken one at three yards <laughs> so or one yard. At, at any rate, uh, deer that don't know you're there, they're moving slowly uh, and or standing. When you shoot one like that, and, and if it's immediately fatal, it drops them in their tracks. The venison you're going to get from that deer is as good and tasty as it can be. You know, a deer that runs a fair distance, bounding or one that's been wounded and runs a fair distance. Is it a deer that's greatly alarmed? Uh, something happens. Uh, when they're greatly alarmed, uh, their blood, uh, the, uh, blood sugar from the food they eat pours into the bloodstream and adrenaline and goes to their whole musculature to feed those muscles so they can make great efforts get away. And one of the end products of all that sugar and that muscle is lactic acid. Now, 
Benson filled with lactic acid is gamey in flavor. That's where that gaminess comes from, with a muscle that's full of lactic acid. Now, you know, in wherever meat is processed in the United States, one of the number one things that is always that they're always thinking to make sure that meat is going to be tasty is to provide a quick and humane end to that animal when it is not all excited, when it's not alarmed, when it's not thrashing around, running, all excited, that's no good. They want to catch them before they start producing a lot of blood sugar and adrenaline in their bloodstream. Drop them in their tracks kind of thing, you know. And that way, that's, they, that produces excellent me, uh, if it's cared for from that point on, but that's number one in the woods, you know. I don't like firing at running deer and taking the chance of merely wounding them because that medicine is not going to be very t tasty because of it. Now, I want to, you know, big old box people say, oh, they're, when they're big and tough and not take a heck. Some of the most tasty medicine I've ever had is but the, the bucks that we butchered, John and I butchered last fall, the three that he took, the big dominant breeding bucks, or the biggest in the areas, uh, were excellent. Oh, was that good venison. I, mine is all gone. I ended up with excellent venison. So dropping them in their tracks when they're not excited is, is important to me. I, I like venison. I like good venison. So I'm always thinking, boy, I, that deer might be a big buck, but it's there he's running fast. You know, this one over here he might be a little smaller, but he's just standing there and he doesn't know I'm here. That's the one I'm going to take because I want good venison. So keep that in mind. You know, it's a good reason for changing the way you've been hunting whitetails. <laughs> you know, you can you can brag for the rest of your life. All the deer I take are usually standing or moving slowly and they don't know I'm anywhere around and they're within say 30 to 50 yards when I, when I fire at them. And, and for that reason I can be, you know, I can be very accurate in fire. I can, I can put my bullet exactly where I want it so I've got a quick, humane end to the deer. That makes me feel better too. I don't want those deer to be suffering. I want to be an excellent one-shot buck hunter. That's what I want to be. And that's what I've been for a long time, and my boys as well. So anyway, keep that in mind. A good reason to become good enough <laughs> to be a regularly successful hunter of mature bucks. Bucks two and a half to six and a half. You know, these are bucks that live in the, in the wilds on their own. and uh, they. The older ones, you know, like three and a half to six and a half, or four and a half to six, they know all about you. I've talked about this before, but they know everything there is to know about stand hunters. So if you keep doing what you're going to do. You're always hunting deer that know everything they know need to know to stay away from you. So you need to change, and not using just one hunting method year after year. Day after day, year after. you got to learn to use a whole bit different bunch of them, like, like we do. We, we use six of them, depending on circumstances. And whichever one we use, we hardly ever use it the same twice in a row. And almost everywhere we hunt, no buck in the woods has any reason to believe we're there, unless they're downwind of us, of course. So it's always a big surprise to them. It happens a big surprise to us. Almost every buck, more older buck we take, we've never seen before. Never, never, except maybe on a trail camp, but never seen in person before until there it is right now because we did, well, we did the things that make it possible for us to be here at the right spot at the right time. You know, when I was young, 10 years old, and I asked Marco, how come we don't get big bucks? He, he laughed and said, well, you got to be at the right place at the right time. I said, well, where is that? Well, he didn't know where that was, but you sure will know when you're there, because there it is. 
Well, it just wasn't happening. Well, today, most of the bucks we take are taken at the right spot at the right time. Because we put all this knowledge, all this experience, the knowledge about our hunting area, knowledge about deer, and knowledge about deer tracks, you know, like this unarmed buck walking out right here, all these things, and knowing it was a big buck, and we put all this together. Now, it doesn't matter how much you learn. We have, we have never come to the point where we know so much and we're so skilled <laughs> that we get one every time or every year, right or the first time we go in the woods, sometimes that happens, almost every year. One of us gets a buck, sometimes two, on opening morning. That happens. I, hate, I almost hate that because what do you do the rest of the season? Sit out there and do it. But at any rate, uh, it, does, it can't happen always. And you can't take every buck. But you can see and take them often enough to, be, to say, I am regularly successful at taking older bucks. And that's what I'm teaching them. But in this fun to see how this happens and, and see the buck I took by knowing, you know, by knowing what to do under these circumstances on that particular morning. Now, you'll have stories like this for years and years and years once you figure out how to put it all together. And this is how we've been doing it for years, this way. Not this specific way, but different way every buck. So we'll talk about more bucks. We got you know a lot of bucks I can talk about. So we'll, next time I see you we'll have that and uh, I hope you enjoyed what, learning what you learned today here. This is something you've never heard of before or, or seen before. So I'm glad you came out of this. So, so this is the real thing. So, uh, but, so I'm glad you get, had a chance to see it. Tell your buddies about it too. Tell them too. You should be watching these this series. Uh, we got an, I've got an awful lot of these seminars now on YouTube. So uh, you, you could spend all or every day. You could be watching these and, until the hunting season begins, and you can't probably get them all. So there's a lot of them, and they're all valuable. So, so anyway. Thanks for watching me today, and uh, I'm looking forward to telling you about another buck. Uh, either I haven't decided which buck yet, one of mine or one of, taken by my sons, or maybe a grandson. They're taking some good ones too. Um, and we'll cover that next time. And uh, with that, uh, take care now with COVID 19. Be, don't treat that. Casually, this is important. You know, uh, you, you are not going to get away with being careless. You're going to get it if you're not if you're careless. And, okay, with that now, be sure to hit that sub subscribe button down below here. Uh, and it, there's advantages to that. You're going to be uh, told right away when I put another one of these seminars up on YouTube. And hit that thumbs up button too. That's important to me for my future, creating more of these seminars on YouTube. So be sure to do that. I, I want to keep doing this as long as I can. No, I'm 85 now. <laughs> so I don't know how many more years or months or maybe days. I hope I never get this disease because that would be dangerous uh, being my age and having had an open heart surgery and a transplant of a, of a heart valve. So take care. We'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.